Web Systems Week 7, Computer Science. Today we're going to look at data representation on computer. Today what we're going to look at is specifically how information is coded on a computer. We're going to look at what information is and how it's encoded on a computer. And we'll look at number systems in the next slide. So, let's look at data representation. The main thing you need to realize is on computers, everything only exists as binary, one on and off. That's all it can recognize, true or false. We'll look at the types of characters and how data is represented in files. Let's see what sort of data is out there. There could be documents, like this PowerPoint, for example. It could be text files, Word documents, or anything else. It could be images, like JPEG, or GIF files, for example. It could be videos, like MPEG or live streaming information like YouTube, for example. It could be audio, like MP3, or any other forms of information out there. But as far as the computer is concerned, it's just numbers. Now, obviously, things like text isn't numbers. So CPUs don't understand what these characters are. In fact, technically, they don't even understand what numbers are. All they understand are binary digits, on, off, on, off, on, 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 off, or something like that. It's a binary computer, a digital computer. So operating system designers had to say, how can we represent characters as numbers? So what they invented was a thing called character encoding. They represented things like the alphabet. For example, all these characters, A, a to Z, 0 to 9, punctuation marks, and so on, they are represented as a number in the operating system. They also eventually said, well, yes, there's obviously A to Z, but that is basically Anglo-centric Latin alphabets. What about things like diacritics? In Latin, for example, Latin alphabets like French, you could have what we call accents, these funny things at the top. Or what about things like pinyin in Chinese? We have funny characters like this on top, tone marks as well. And what about symbols that aren't that common, or that are common now, like a copyright symbol? or currency symbols, or about the euro symbol. So we need to have the ability to extend this character representation. And we also need to find how these file formats store this information. Let's take a quick look at this. Now, when we look at character encoding, there's different ways of doing it. There's a prehistoric, when I mean prehistoric, we're talking about the 1960s, 1970s, and even 1980s, form of character encoding done by IBM called EBCDIC. Um, which really came from a thing called punch cards. As one of the earliest representation of characters, IBM used a concept called punch cards to decide on what these characters look like. And I'll show you that in a moment. But here's an example. This is uh, a, uh, a chart that says basically the first digit is represented in this vertical and the second digit is represented in the horizontal. So A, for example, is represented as C1 in hexadecimal which is equal to uh, 193 in decimal. B, for example, would be represented as C2. So C2, that's equal to 194. So they had various representations of different characters, and as you can see on this chart. This came out because of a concept called punch cards. Now, the thing to note is, each of these vertical components represent a row on a punch card. So, if you can see quite carefully, A happens to be this hole in the punch card and this digit here. B happens to be the second one, and it's the second hole. So C is this row here, and 1 is the verticals. They had a special format for it. Let's take a look at the next digits. J, for example, that would be this row, and the first digit. Let's take a look at what that is. J would be, J happens to be, oops, off this chart, D, 1, in this particular case. Um, don't worry about memorizing this. It's not examinable. Now, as EBCDIC was great if you had punch cards, 
but as you can see the numbers and digits didn't really necessarily make sense. They were in blocks of 16 and they were off in the right hand corner. So C1 had no relationship to J1, um, D1 for example, which is D. ASCII was the alternative character set. And this was done, this was developed by a different group, the American Standards Organization, not by a corporate like IBM. And it simply said, we'll take seven bits and they'll represent 128 different characters. This was extended to the ISO standard, International Standards Organization, called ISO 8859, where they made an extended this ASCII to add other characters, like Latin characters, like accented characters, Cyrillic, Russian characters, Arabic characters, Hebrew, Greek, strangely enough, even Thai characters. So look it up. It introduced a concept called code pages. So code page one was the standard Western set of characters. Code page two was, for example, Northern European, and so on. Let's take a look at some examples. This is what an ASCII table looks like. It says character 65, in this particular case, represents A. Now there's actually a distinct pattern to this, which is very good. You simply add 32 to the number, so 97, 65 plus 32 is 97, makes it in a lowercase character. So you can see the direct one-to-one -one relationship between each of the characters, which is fantastic. And even things like numbers are in the same block. You could do calculations based on this. Notice three zero, sorry, three zero to three nine nicely represents the digits. Um, this is an example of ISO 8859. See the top half? Standard ASCII. That's fine. So A is 41 in hexadecimal, 65 in decimal. And if you want to do A accent, it's simply zero. My apologies. It's C zero. So C0 is A with that funny little thing on top of it. I think it's called a accent of some kind. Happens to be 192. So it's very nice, logical. And this bottom page in blue actually is a code page. So this is the Latin 1 extension. There's at least 14 others out there. For example, I think Thai is code page 14 in this list. So, since ASCII computers only own numbers, we use ASCII to encode text. So let's see, well, let's call the word hello. Let's see what it looks like. That's equal to this, H-E-L-L-O, which is decimal 104, decimal 101, 108, 108, and 111. And we can see the pattern here. Oh. Um, now, the problem with this is that it's very, I guess, Western-centric or alphabetic-centric. 128 characters, possibly extended through ISO 8890, that adds 16 times 128, which is a lot more characters. But it doesn't cope with the sheer number of characters needed for, for example, Chinese. So what do we do? They created a concept called Unicode, where basically we have two, two bytes or more representing a character. So instead of this code page concept, we said everything is simply two bytes. Of course, the problem with that is it uses a lot more storage. So they created a thing called UTF-8, which is basically a variable length encoding. So it's not double byte. It's usually one byte, unless your character is 128 or higher, where we suddenly go to two bytes instead, or even three bytes or four bytes. It's a special pattern. I suggest you look it up in Wikipedia, Unicode on UTF-8. It tells you the special patterns that's used. That's the most common. In fact, this is the standard required for HTML. UTF-16 is the other version where every character is always two bits, uh, two bytes, or four bytes. Two bytes is a byte is eight bits, by the way, or 32 bits, which is four bytes. Okay. They've kept the first 128 characters exactly the same as ASCII, so it's very compatible. And incidentally, if you do any coding in HTML, typically you would use UTF-8. Because, I um, hate to say this, the English language or the Western fonts are still the most popular on the web. I suggest you look up something called Puny Code if you have a chance to, to see how it's represented somewhere else. Just Google it. 
PU in Y, if I can write clearly. So here's an example of Unicode for that same set of extension characters we saw earlier, the Latin 1 supplement. We have that A with an accent. So instead of the previous example, A happened to be A with the accent, happens to be called C0. Now it's actually a larger concept called double byte. So it's actually 00 C0. Zero zero. Okay, notice it's now 00 C0. Zero zero. In other words, it's two bytes, two characters. What about, for example, Chinese? Well, Chinese use the concept called CJK, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, unified ideographs. And there's a huge list, literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of characters there, have certain standardized characters. For example, this character here is 6XB3, or B2, my apologies. And let's see what that's like. Um, the Unicode has a special extension area where you can, there are a lot of fonts out there which are not standard, but are able for private use. And there's a group called the um, Conscript Registry, which keeps a track of private usage. For example, I don't know if you've seen this, ever seen these sort of fonts before. Look up Star Trek, it's Klingon. The fonts on this side, Klingon. Um, this is Runic. And this is actually a real code badge, but in Tolkien, this is also called Dwarvish. And this group here, I don't know if anybody recognizes this, this is called Tengwa. It's actually Elvish from Lord of the Rings as well. So you can represent fonts in many ways. In fact, if you get some certain font code sets, this is actually built in. You can view Klingon, Dwarvish, and Elvish in the in natural web page. No problems there. It also includes Unicode, includes emojis. For example, the old classic smiley face. Here's an example. Let's take a look. Smiling face with open mouth. Unicode 1F6003. In other words, the old fashioned smiley face. And it's, this example we've got here actually shows the fact that you have different representations on different browsers. For example, um, on the iPhone, it happens to be this. On Twitter, it looks like this. On Google, it looks like this. On Samsung, it looks like this. And Windows, it looks like this. Gmail, it looks like this. Standard characters out there. So, let's see how much storage is required. Now, in most cases, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Each individual character H-E-L-L-O space H-E-R-O question mark are represented as one byte. Let's check it out. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 characters, which is cool. What about this? And incidentally, if you don't know what this means, that's actually how you say Australia in Chinese. Australia. How many characters would that be? Could it be four? One, two, three, four. Obviously not. In fact, what it looks like is the same character looked at the earlier uni CJK Unicode chart. This was the first character, 6FB3. The second one is 5927, 55229, 4E9A. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that is 8 characters, or 8 bytes more correctly, for 4 characters. What about this? Smiley face. Now, do you remember the emoji chart? I'll leave that for you to work out. Well, actually, no, I don't. It's 01 F603. It's three characters. Strangely enough, if you wrote this as text, it looks like this. Colon, minus, parentheses. Three characters. Which is, by some coincidence, deliberate. Okay, what about images? We might have a GIF, or JPEG, or an AVI from a movie, or Word documents. What do they look like? Well, the trick is, your extension often tells you exactly what the format is. So we see a file called week7.pdf. 
we can roughly guess that this will be a PDF document, but it may not be. For example, when you're being spammed or fished on the web for your email, they fake it. So often the internals of the file actually tells you what the actual file is. So yes, we might see a file called week7.pdf, but reality is it might be JavaScript or an executable under the covers. And if your browser is set up incorrectly, or your mail client set up incorrectly, it might execute it, which is very, very bad news. So often inside the actual file itself, there's a few magic bytes that tell the operating system what the actual real file type is. For example, in Unix, we don't care what the file type is. We don't care at all. By convention we use file types but it does not have to have any relationship to what type of file it is. We use this magic thing called a 4cc or magic number in the file. For example, if you look at a GIF file through a hex editor, you'll see a keyword that says GIF89A in the first uh, six bytes of the file. You'll see ID3 for MP3 files. PDF files are this magic, percent PDF 1.5 version number. It could be 0 0.4, 0 0.6 for example. For shell scripts, and you've done bash already I've hope, you've tried a few bits, you've done scripting, there's a magic thing called a shebang, hash exclamation mark. The first two bytes in a shell script, that tells it that this is a shell script. You might use PK for zip files. And if you ever look in a Microsoft format, OpenXML it's called, you'll notice the file type is dot, for example, docx, it actually starts with pk because Microsoft decided to use the open standard zip format as a compression and container format for their documents. So you can look at any Word document, rename it to .zip and you can actually view it with a, a standard uh, archive viewer. So here's an example. This is an actual example. The picture of me on my website this is the contents of the actual file. Do you notice that JFIF is here? That means, this first set here, actually means that it's a JPEG file. If you ever see a word corrupt, there's something wrong with that. This character, all the characters here, might look like actual characters, but they're not. They're actually internally, they're stored as these bytes of some kind. This is just the, the viewer I'm using, making it look like ASCII. So, that's the end of our data representation. If you have a chance to, use a binary editor and look at the contents of different types of documents out there and try to understand the fact that why documents are done the way they are.